This is the largest counterfeit operation in the UK. He flooded England with eight billion dollars worth of fake money. What makes him a criminal mastermind is he produced a product that had an awful lot of people fooled for a very long time. He was the most amazing counterfeiter authorities had ever seen. The Bank of England responded to my funny money by changing design. They just could put up a bit of competition. <laughs> Find out how he did it next on Mastermind. London, home of the Bank of England, printer of one of the world's most illustrious currencies. The pound is the world's most difficult currency to counterfeit. Dollars, for example, are very easy to print because they've got very few colors. I mean, anybody can forge a dollar. The pound, though, is very complex. If you start, first of all, with the watermark, which is in the paper itself, you then have the silver line, which is woven in the paper. Going on from there, you have the intricacy of the artwork. But in 1993, police were shocked to discover massive amounts of fake money spreading throughout the country. They had never seen notes of this quality. As far as a counterfeiter was concerned, they were the best. They were very, very good. This was the first time ever that a complete clandestine money forging printing business had been run in this country, turning out huge volumes of money. By the mid-90s, authorities estimated there were two billion pounds, three billion dollars of counterfeit money in circulation. It's just how much money. It's baffling. You can bail out a small country with that kind of money. I mean, it was amazing. Police believe the London mob was behind the operation. It touched on the street criminal right up to the upper echelon of organized crime. It was massive. Police had really been going out doing undercover operations, search warrants and arrests, and seizing quantities of counterfeit, but never getting to the root of the problem. They didn't realize the root of the problem wasn't a large organization. It was a single daring mastermind who relish challenging them. You do get a certain buzz um, from what you're doing, like, yeah? It's just a question of almost like cops and robbers type of thing, like, yeah? You're trying to work out a scheme, and you know they're trying to catch you, and while well, they're not catching you, and you're earning lots of money. This operation is clearly one of the best, if not the best, in the world. Stephen Jory had done the impossible, defeating the toughest anti-counterfeit measures ever devised and making himself millions. The question is, how did he do it? Growing up in London's rough East End, master counterfeiter Stephen Jory was exposed to crime at an early age. I got drawn to what seemed to be the glamour of various criminal enterprises. Not violent armed robberies or anything like that. More, more sort of clever frauds as I saw them. He, he likes to think he's very clever. Um, and I would think in certain aspects he probably is. In the mid-80s, Jory makes his first big score after he learns the perfume business is driven by brand name and image. There's not that much difference in price between cheap perfume and expensive perfume. The price difference is in the packaging. The actual perfume itself, there isn't really that much difference, which set, set a chain of thought in my mind. Then I could see the potential. He finds a printer and counterfeits designer perfume boxes, filling them with cheap perfume. He makes hundreds of thousands of pounds, but spends even more. Stephen's lifestyle was good cars, surround himself with friends that he liked to drink and eat with. He was a womanizer, and he liked the high life. I made a lot of money, and I then decided once I finished this last batch of um, perfume, then that would be it. But sadly, things didn't work out that way. Jory is arrested while delivering fake perfume. 
I ended up with a six and a half year sentence, which to me seemed outrageous because as far as I'm aware, no one's ever died from an overdose of perfume. In 1991, Stevens released, but his perfume fortune has vanished. Jury out of jail needed something to do. He had happened to be uh, in an affair with a woman called Claire Mainston, and she had a dad, a uh, respectable businessman, who ran a printing business. Mainstone, we believe, a bit down on his luck business-wise. Clearly, Stephen, being Stephen, saw that as an opportunity and took full advantage of it. Jory has a big idea. Instead of printing perfume boxes to make money, he offers to hire Mainstone to print the money itself. Stephen is a good talker. He would make a good salesman. And clearly, he painted a lovely picture and how much success that they both could obtain from this criminal enterprise. He goes down to Mainstone's house, big 14 room house on the fringes of London. And I think all these pieces came together and they formed a very unlikely duo. The deal is simple. Jory will buy a state-of-the-art four-color printing press if Mainstone will operate it. But to get the press, Stephen needs 50,000 pounds, and he's flat broke. He meets with a notorious London loan shark who agrees to advance the money at 100% interest. Installments are to be paid promptly, or Jory will face his enforcer, Eugene. Eugene, he's a very heavy gangster. He's one of the most um, dangerous men in England. If I tried to not pay him £50,000, then I'd probably be killed. Jory now moves fast. He buys a second-hand press, installs it on Mainstone's estate, then sets up a security system. He had electronic beams at the front gate so that anyone coming in, he would get some warning of it. To start the printing, Jory needs a high-resolution computer scan of a 20-pound note. Through his connections with the Russian Mafia, he finds a scan man in Germany. With this scan, an electrostatic image can be created inside the printer. Next, he needs to find a supply of high-quality paper. I found some paper which had the appearance of being a genuine note, and the paper felt very much like the real thing once it was crumpled up and everything. And you have to use special inks. We experimented with several different inks, like that. It was a matter of trial and error. They start blending the inks to match the colors on the 20-pound note. It's exacting work. Finally, after three weeks, they produce flawless prints. But the hard part is just beginning. Jory must now defeat the security features that the press can't reproduce. The toughest is the silver metal strip. Silver foil goes into the paper when it's actually being made. It's a very complicated process, one which would be virtually impossible to duplicate by a counterfeiter. But Stephen has a solution. He travels to the Isle of Wight to enlist the help of an old friend from his perfume days, Bernie Ferrier. Bernie Ferrier was an engineer by profession. Farrier's part in the operation was actually putting the silver strip into the counterfeit notes. And they used a hot foiling machine, which gave the impression that the silver foil was actually woven into the note, but actually it wasn't. It was printed on top. A second security feature is a subtle image of the queen impressed within the paper. Jory deals with this watermark himself. The way to do it is just to draw an outline of the queen's head and then just shade it in with pencil. They managed to print a watermark on the surface of the paper that looked like it was within the structure of the paper. Jory believes he's now defeated every security feature. As a test, he distributes 50,000 pounds worth of 20 pound notes. But there's a problem with the watermark. Got a little bit over enthusiastic when I shaded it in her chin. The Queen looked as though she had a shade for a couple of weeks. Obvious fakes, badly done. Jory's now falling behind on his loan payments, and Eugene delivers a message. This time, he has to get it right. 
And so the next batch we made sure that the, um, the Queen didn't have a five o'clock shadow. The quality of the notes was so good, the Bank of England was in a bit of a panic. It's only really when you hold uh, a counterfeit next to an original £20 note in good light can you really tell the difference. One on its own, I'll defy most people to tell that it's a counterfeit. Now Jory sets up a distribution network with himself at the top. If we give the analogy of the cocaine, he was not going to bag it up into little ounce bags, a kilo of cocaine, and go out and sell it. So he would find distributors, sell to them quantities of a million, half a million, 100,000, 200,000. As he moves between his printer and his distributors, Stephen makes sure he can't be followed. I had about six different cars parked in different areas. Once I was satisfied there was nobody following me, I'd then drive to one of the cars, get out, get into that car, and then drive off. The system is designed to frustrate investigators by keeping everything on a strict need-to-know basis. You need just to have people in their little cells doing what they're doing. You know very little about the rest of it. The operation finally starts to pay off. Jory clears his debts, and now even the loan shark wants to distribute his fake bills. Anyone in that business was going mad for the money. <laughs> Cause a bit of a bit of a storm, a bit of a rush. <laughs> Stephen Jory is now making millions. I've always had nice cars. I used to, used to drive Jag about. I used to have different cars. Join the benefits of the money like that. The master counterfeiter is at the top of his game, but his massive operation will soon be threatened by two tiny strips of waste paper. Stephen Jory is now running the most successful counterfeiting ring in British history. But as his fake cash floods the country, there's a national uproar, and the police start leaning on their underworld contacts. Stephen Jury's name came into it. He was associating with other known counterfeiters, and information from various sources was saying he's involved. Paul Wright um, found out about me and the way the police normally find out about people, someone phones them up and sells them. Because the police can't rely on the word of an informant to make an arrest, they follow Jory, hoping to catch him red-handed. But Stephen is looking out for them. When he was carrying something dirty, i.e. he had counterfeit currency in his car, or paper, or ink, he would carry out anti-surveillance measures. And I never found that hard to spot them, like right? they'd always use two motorbikes and say three or four cars. One car would turn off, you look in the mirror and another car would carry on. He could be going down the road at ten mile an hour. But then I'll put my foot down and I'm gone. He would reach speeds of 80, 90, 100 mile an hour. At one point when he was being followed, he just drove his car straight across a golf course to escape. You know, people playing golf, and some of this mad guy in the car was zooming straight across, scattering everybody out of the way. It's very, very difficult to follow someone like that, both practically and from a safety point of view. Police need a new strategy. Through his underworld connections, Detective Paul Wright learns that Jory has been seen near a garage in London's East End. Wright begins to drop by the garage on a regular basis. Then, coming back to the office, and I always came back via the garage, would walk through and take a look. I found some paper outside. As soon as I got in the office and pulled the paper out, I knew what it was. It was the cuttings of 20-pound notes. The authorities now move in. My heart almost stopped because I knew this, this was the police, like, you know, one of whom was Paul Wright. And he said to me, Stephen Jory, I'm arresting you for, on, on suspicion of being in uh, possession of counterfeit currency. Inside the garage, they find a million and a half pounds in counterfeit notes. That was when I knew I was in big trouble like that. But Stephen manages to convince police he's not the mastermind. They offer him a deal. He said to me, do you think you could um, find out who the printer is? And um, I said, yeah, well, I can try. Jory now sets out to give them a fall guy. As soon as he's released on bail, he meets with his loan shark and Eugene, who are now major distributors of his product. 
they find someone willing to take the rap. Stephen did give us information that led to a garage in the East End of London. We recovered from the garage 19 million in counterfeit currency. There was a man arrested at the time. The authorities reward Stephen for his supposed cooperation by dropping the most serious charges against him. But by the time it came to court, they'd worked out that it was some kind of setup. But by this time, the charges had already been dropped, so there was nothing they could do about it. Jory gets 21 months on a minor possession charge. After 10 months, he's released and does the last thing police expect. So what I do, obviously, naturally, as soon as I come out, the press has started rolling again. Within a few months, he's producing millions. And now he's more security conscious than ever. His toughest problem is getting rid of the notes that aren't good enough to pass. You've got the run where you haven't got it right and the notes are blurred. What do you do with that? Stephen turns to his trusted colleague on the Isle of Wight, Bernie Ferrier. I did ask him to do one other job, and that was to burn uh, some of the waste, because we had quite a lot of waste, which is very difficult to burn. But the police have mounted electronic surveillance on him, and his pager messages to Ferrier are intercepted. London authorities contact police on the Isle of Wight. They raid Ferrier's shop and find high-quality paper, silver foil, and then the mother -load. I think it was nine reams of paper, which were all Kenford Bank of England notes. Subsequently, it turned out they were actually waste sheets that um, jewellery had actually given to Farrier to dispose of, and for whatever reason, Farrier hadn't. What he was doing was going through the sheets and cutting some notes that was half decent and then passing them on the Isle of Wight like that. Among the notes in Ferrier's shop, police find a flyer for a trailer park. So we went and asked them where they'd had their printing done and they pointed us in the direction of Kenneth Mainstone. Believing Mainstone is Stephen Jory's printer, Police now move to cut the heart out of his counterfeiting operation. When we went there, we didn't have a search warrant. I clearly remember walking up the drive and thinking, this could be my career going out the window. Mainstone answers the door and does the big indignant, you, you've got no right to come in here, you don't have a search warrant. He was very agitated, not violent, but you could see that he was very concerned about why we were there. Inside, police find 12 million pounds in fake money. The game is over for Ken Mainstone. With his printer now in custody, Jory's desperate to unload his remaining counterfeit currency. He starts taking chances, and Paul Wright and a team of officers finally manage to follow him unnoticed. In a parking lot, they watch as Jory meets an associate. We knew that Jury had just carried out uh, a criminal transaction, um, so we went to arrest him. One of the officers said, well, look what we found. We hit the jackpot. Two bags that contained three quarters of a million pounds face value of counterfeit 20 pound notes. I took him to one side. He was obviously distressed with it all. I was scratching my head, pulling my hair out, trying to think of a way to get out of it. I said, it's the end this time. Stephen Jory is arrested on the charges of making and passing counterfeit currency. His massive operation is finally brought down. We've recovered something like 36 million pounds in notes that were printed by him. How much more is there? That's anyone's guess. Jory's accomplice, Bernard Ferrier, dies of cancer on the Isle of Wight while awaiting trial. Kenneth Mainstone elects to fight the charges against him, but is found guilty and is sentenced to 12 years. Because Jory pleads guilty to all the charges against him, he receives a reduced sentence of eight years. What makes Stephen Jury a, a criminal mastermind is that he produced a product that had an awful lot of people fooled for a very long time. 
The Bank of England responded to my funny money um, by changing the design. And, um, <laughs> they just couldn't put up a bit of competition. <laughs> Released from prison in 1999, Jory is now establishing a new life as an artist and author. He's written a book about his life of crime. I've come to like him. It'd be a lad that I would have a pint with on a Friday night. Unfortunately, we're on different sides of the fence. Oh, <laughs> yeah.